Welcome to Computer Science 320 2015 Winter 1's Midterm 1 Practice Problems. We're working on Problem 4, Part 3, and we've just finished Part 2, where we made a reduction from the minimum spanning subgraph problem with negative edge weights to the minimum spanning subgraph problem without negative edge weights. We've got the reduction up here. Now we're going to give and briefly justify a good theta bound on our reduction's worst case runtime in terms of the number of nodes V and edges E. And we get to assume the input is in the form of an adjacency list, presumably for both problems, the one that we're reducing from and the one that we're reducing to. We need to describe any other data structure details necessary to justify our bound. So let's see. Uh, again, the, the easy part is, just like on the previous problem, is algorithm two. When we get a solution to the minimum spanning subgraph problem with no negative edge weights, we're going to get a list of edges that are part of that minimum spanning subgraph, and we just need to add back in the negative edges. And that should take, even if we have to go back to the original adjacency list and search through it for negative edges, that should take theta v plus e time. We may also have to be a little bit careful to find the right edges from the solution to this problem, since it's going to have edges on contracted vertices rather than original vertices. Uh, but if we build up an intermediate data structure to look that up later on, hopefully that won't take any additional time. So we spent theta v plus e so far. Now we need to go back up here and contract all the negative edges in V, creating an adjacency list as input to the new graph. Well, contracting those negative edges, you know, if we've got this negative five edge here, um, contracting that is actually a lot like what we do in the minimum spanning tree algorithms that we looked at in the textbook. So a uh, Kruskal's algorithm, for example, when it takes an edge and it merges the two nodes on either side of the edge, it puts them into the same uh, category of nodes, this connected component that we've built up so far. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to keep throwing nodes into the same category over and over again. So we can actually use the same data structure. We can use that disjoint set union find data structure to merge or contract all negative weight edges. Now, finding the negative edge weight, the, the negative weight edges, that's something that we already did up here. That's that's v plus e time just to find them. And then doing this contraction, well, we do it once per edge. And each time we're contracting a particular edge, we're going to do two find operations to see which group are the vertices that are already on that edge in. If they're in different groups, we'll do a merge operation. But regardless, the, the number of operations we'll do overall is going to be upper bounded by our number of edges, in particular our number of negative edges. And if we look up this implementation in section 4.6 in the textbook or on the web or something like that, what we're going to find out is the average cost of each of these operations, the, the average cost, is theta of the inverse Ackermann's function of v, which is the same thing that we came up with in the exercise in class where we were working with something like a minimum spanning tree problem. We're going to do that e times, so our total is going to be at most, in the worst case, e times the inverse Ackermann's function of v. So we're spending v plus e plus e times the inverse Ackermann's function of v time so far. And now what we've got is we've kind of, you can imagine we've got v1, v2, v3, v4, v5. And effectively, we've got um, this one is in group 1, this one's in group 1, this one's in group 2, this one's in group 3, and this one's in group 2. We've got a mapping kind of like this, which is what we get from using the disjoint set union find data structure to merge out all these edges. What we haven't done so far is eliminated the edges that have higher cost if we have repeat edges. We haven't yet uh, restructured our adjacency list and that sort of thing. So we're actually also going to need to do that. So we've, we've done step one of A1, we found the minimum 
so I found the negative edges, so that was this part right here, and then we've used disjoint set union find to contract all those negative weight edges in the sense that we know what group they're in, but we haven't quite created the new graph. So create the new adjacency list. And this is actually kind of tricky. Uh, because we've got the old adjacency list over one set of vertices, we've got the new adjacency list over a different set of vertices. We're, we're going to have to uh, kind of smoosh some of the edges together, eliminate some of the other edges. This is an undirected graph, so an edge that goes from V1 to V2 also goes from V2 to V1, and we're going to have to deal with that. Um, so I kind of think it's going to be easier to switch to an adjacency matrix representation. Adjacency matrices make it easier to reason about edges in some sense, in some particular ways. So remember, an adjacency matrix is just a V by V array. So there's V columns and there's V rows. And a particular entry like this one just represents an edge between whatever vertex is numbered here and whatever vertex is numbered here. And we can store all kinds of information here, uh, including a weight on the edge, for example. But basically what happens is the time to look up whether an edge exists between two vertices or to do something with that edge becomes constant time. The disadvantage is we're going to take v squared space here, and if we want to traverse over all of the edges incident on a particular vertex, we have to spend v time doing it, because we have to go all the way down a column or across a row of the matrix. But that's not going to turn out to be a big deal for us. So to create my new adjacency list, what I'm actually going to do is part A, I'm going to create an adjacency matrix. over these groups of vertices. So this is creating it after I have already uh, taken care of the contraction. So I, I have fewer vertices potentially than I had before. Um, so initially I'll just, uh, I'll just set all of those up to not have edges between them. So that alone, just, just creating this uh, blank adjacency matrix, if you'd like. That's going to take theta v squared time in the worst case. Because, <clears throat> you know, I have to set all these entries up to have no edges. Uh, then I'm going to fill it in. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go over all the existing edges. If one of the existing edges is, is like this edge that I've drawn here, if there's an edge between V1 and V2 and they're in the same group, then I'm just going to skip it. That will be true of negative weighted edges. All the negative weighted edges will between, be between vertices in the same group. But you could also imagine a, a situation like this. There's a negative 1 edge here and a negative 2 edge here, and there's a 10 edge here. Well, these two vertices are now going to be in the same group because these vertices and these vertices got contracted. So we'll also skip that 10 edge. For other edges, we're going to put them in, but what if we end up with two edges between the same pair of group vertices? That can happen. Again, that's that situation where, like, these two vertices over here, um, they've both got an edge to this vertex, and one of those edges is cheaper. Well, we just want to keep the cheaper one. So if we run across the same uh, edge twice, what is now the same edge because of contractions, we'll keep the cheaper one. So we're going to skip edges within a group, and we're going to uh, overwrite more expensive edges. Now, again, the edges that we get back from our underlying problem, they're going to connect these group vertices. We need to go back and get the original edges. You know, like maybe all the cities in Alberta are all one group now. Uh, when we later decide that it's Calgary that we want to connect to um, Vancouver, um, we need to know that it's Calgary, not that it's some city in Alberta. Um, so another thing we can keep track of here, so keep track of the original 
vertices for that cheapest edge. So, you know, we'll only keep this two edge in this example, but we'll remember that it was this vertex and this vertex that the edge was between, not this vertex up top. Okay, so we'll do all of that, and then finally we'll create an adjacency matrix for the under, sorry, adjacency list for the underlying problem. So uh, we already decided step A takes theta v squared time. How long does step B take? Well, again, we're going over all the edges, so that's v plus e time. Um, checking whether two, uh, whether an edge crosses different groups or stays in the same group, that's constant time given that we've already got this sort of array up here that tells us the mapping from a vertex to its group. So that's no problem. Skipping edges, constant time. Overriding more expensive edges, constant time. So we're just spending v plus e time here. Uh, down here on C, we are creating our adjacency list again for the underlying problem. We're going to have to create an array with V entries in it. And for each entry, we're going to have to have edges. And to do that, we're going to have to run over the whole adjacency list. So we're going to spend V squared time working over the adjacency list because there are V squared entries in the adjacency list. We're going to have to uh, initialize this array, that's going to take v time, but that of course will be dominated by v squared. And then we're going to, for every edge, be putting two entries uh, into this array, one the forward edge and one the reverse edge. Uh, so we'll also spend e time. But it turns out that e is upper bounded by v squared, v is dominated by v squared, so we can actually drop these terms. And again, we're spending v squared here. So when we add all these together, the v squared time we spend on line A, the v plus e time we spend on line B, the v squared time we spend on line C, overall creating this new adjacency list takes v squared time. This might not be the most efficient way to go about it, but I kind of like having this adjacency matrix. It makes the implementation easier in my mind. And also, when we go back from the solution to the underlying problem, if it says, oh, we need the edge between group two and group three, well, the edge between group two and group three is a particular edge in the original graph, and we'll have stored that in this adjacency matrix. We set that up right here where we said keep track of the original vertices. So that's good. That's a good feature. It means we really will only spend V plus E time transitioning back. So we've got a bunch of Vs, a bunch of Es, a bunch of V squares all added together. The Es are all going to go away. The Vs are all going to go away because V squared is at least as expensive as any one of those. And then additionally, we've got this one piece right here, E times Acker, inverse Ackermann's function of V. And that's not necessarily dominated by V squared. Uh, in a complete graph, for example, it wouldn't be dominated by V squared. In, in anything that was kind of, a, uh, if you like, a little bit asymptotically less than complete, it would end up being dominated by V squared. So overall then, we can give a final bound if only I had room somewhere here. I'm going to give myself a bit more room. We can give ourselves a final bound overall theta of v squared plus e times the inverse Ackermann's function of v. All right, next we will move on to part four of the same problem.